Okay, welcome everyone to this virtual swag session at the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries. My name is Leah DeForest. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the communications manager with Texas Digital Library. I'm really pleased that you've all made time to join us today. First, some housekeeping. I'm going to drop a link here in chat. But TDL and the TCDL planning committee are dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that's free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all people. We ask that everyone here today be considerate and respectful in speech and action, attempt collaboration before conflict, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior in speech, and please be mindful of your environment and of your fellow participants. You can also view our code of conduct on tdl.org. There's a link there in chat. And this session will run until approximately 1.50 p.m. We don't have an official break time scheduled in here, so please feel free to take breaks as you need. We are recording this session. For those of you who are just joining, I'm gonna drop that info right there again. I invite you all to say hello in chat and let us know where you're joining from. You're welcome to share any resources and make comments throughout today's session. I'll be watching for your questions in chat and we'll share them with Kara during the Q&A portion at the end. And now on with the show, I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker, Kara Perez, founder of Bravely Go. And I'm gonna hand things over to you now to get started, Kara. Awesome. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Kara, and we're going to talk about money. I have got a presentation for y'all. Um, before we jump into that, I just want to ask everyone to either grab a notebook or your open your notes app on your phone, but something you can write in because I have a few exercises for us today. I'm very much so one of those people that is like, how, like uh, what's the word I want here? Not great for a digital library saying, I'm like, what's the word? <laughs> um, actionable takeaways, that's the word that I want. So I really want y'all to be able to walk away from this session with a short little money to-do list. So please grab something you can write with. I am gonna go ahead and share my screen and let's do this. We'll get into the presentation. I'm also going to shrink y'all's faces so I can't see your beautiful faces anymore, but um, I can see anything you put in the chat and feel free to ask questions as we go. We've also got time for questions at the end. So welcome to Talk Money to Me. Um, a little bit about me and why I'm here in front of you today. Uh, my name is Kara Perez. I have a company called Bravely Go, and we do financial education. And I always like to start pretty much all my presentations by talking about myself, not because I'm some sort of egomaniac, but because I know that talking about money can be really difficult and a little bit uncomfortable. And especially we just met, you know, you don't really know anything about me and I don't really know very much about you yet. So if I was like, Hey, what do you have in your checking account right now? You'd probably be like, uh, rude. <laughs> but if I tell you that I graduated college in 2011 with $25,302 in student loan debt and an English degree, uh, you might be like, okay, I'm warming up to you. And if I tell you that I worked tables, I waited tables rather, for the first three years out of school because I could not find a job that was interested in my English degree. Anyone who graduated between, you know, 08 and I think 2012 knows the pain of those kind of recession, technically post-recession, but very much so like in the recession years. And still to this day, I've never had a salaried full-time job. No one has ever looked at me and said, hey girl, let's get you a 401k. So <laughs> I had to make my own. Um, and I come from a low income background. I grew up in a single parent household. I have two siblings. Uh, we were on food stamps for about six years when I was growing up. And then in my twenties, I'm in my mid thirties. Now I was very low income. I made 18 grand before taxes in 2014. Um, in 2015, I broke 30K before taxes. And I'll tell you what, I felt like a millionaire. I was like, move over Elon Musk. I'm here. <laughs> um, and that was the year that I paid off my student loan. So I paid off 
about $30,000 in student loans plus interest in three and a half years, all while being low income. And I started investing in 2015 with an IRA. And if you don't know what an IRA is, don't worry, you will by the end of this session. So I can honestly say that learning about money changed my life and it led me to start my business, which like I said, we're a financial education company. I like to use the word feminist because I talk about things like race and gender and um, how we show up in this world because all of that impacts our money, right? We know all of that impacts our money from how we get paid to how we're treated at work to how seriously people take us and our financial health. So if this sounds like your jam, here's where you can find me on the internet. We're on Instagram, we're on TikTok, uh, Facebook at We Bravely Go, and then Twitter, if that's more your jam, just at Bravely Go. But okay. Enough about me. Here's what we're going to talk about today. First of all, what is financial health and what should we sort of be aiming for in our financial lives to be healthy and to be honestly just like content and happy? We're going to talk a little bit about budgeting. We're going to talk about organizing your debt. And we are going to talk a little bit about um, what even is investing. So love that. Um, and I love the chat here. People are like, yes, liberal arts degree is absolutely amazing. We are here. We are strong. We are powerful. So first things first, what is financial health? So financial health really boils down to living without fear, anxiety around money and living without a lack of money. So financial anxiety is basically you not waking up at four o'clock in the morning panicking about how you're going to pay off your student loan debts. It's not you freezing up at the grocery store saying, can I even afford this? It's you being able to go out to eat with your friends. And when the bill comes and your portion is $55, you're like, I can afford that. No problem. Instead of that, oh my God, how did it get to be $55? You know, we all have had those moments, right? I'm not the only one. <laughs> or maybe I am. Um, and so your financial health is made up of your investments, your income streams, your cash savings, and your financial literacy. You can have a gazillion dollars. You can be richer than the billionaires. But if you don't know what to do with money and what your own financial needs are, you won't be financially healthy. And then these other parts, the income, the investments and the savings, these are what I like to think of as our financial support systems that help build our financial health. So money is a tool, but not everyone has access to that. I think it's really important that we talk about the, I mean, the fact that we're all here today, and again, I don't know how everyone here, I don't know everyone here's backgrounds, um, I don't know how everyone identifies, but I'm willing to bet we're not sitting in a room of 15 Cara Perez's who have the exact same uh, racial identity and gender identity and life experience to me, right? <laughs> we are all different, and I think it's really important to understand when we talk about financial health, that's gonna mean different things to different people and in different communities. And so here's just kind of like a mind blowing statistic that will bum you out a little bit probably. Uh, when we talk about net worth, that means the sum total of your assets minus your debts. So things like your investments, your cash savings, how much equity you have in a home, minus things like your credit card debt and your mortgage. And whatever number comes out there at the bottom after that, uh, simple math, that's your net worth. And white people in the United States are crushing it. And that's because of systemic racism, largely. And everyone else who is non-white does not have as much money as white people. That's really how it gets broken down. We have a wealth gap in this country. And I think when we talk about financial health, I wanna talk about financial health for our communities as well as us as individuals. And if you are a member of a non-white community, I think it's important for us to understand that there's going to be different needs and there's going to be different opportunities, right? And if you're a member of a white community, I think it's really important for us to ask ourselves as white folks, um, what am I doing here? You know, how am I working to change this? What am I doing to create a more equitable financial world? So money falls into two categories. There's the things that you can control and the things that you cannot control. And your financial health is going to fall in the middle of that. So the things that you cannot control, I think right now we're feeling a lot of these things, right? Inflation, the stock market performance, policy decisions like tax law, 
institutional racism and sexism, um, what your coworkers or what your bosses are doing. You can't control the, their actions, right? You can't control the housing market or the stock market, like I mentioned. Those are things outside of your individual control. Believe me, if I could control the housing market, I would own <laughs> right now. And I am a 34 year old renter um, whose rent is going up here in Austin. Uh, that's where I am. And so I can't control the housing market, right? But in the Venn diagram I've got here, the things that I can control, I can control learning about money, how much I'm putting into learning about money. I can control how much I talk about money and who I talk about money with. If you ever want to chat about money and no one in your life is like, yeah, I absolutely do want to examine, you know, Texas state tax law, you can DM me and I'll talk about it with you because I have a lot of thoughts on all things money. And talking about it really is one of the most powerful things in our control. So if we say to our coworkers, you know, like, I'd love to do a salary transparency day. Like, I'll tell you how much I make. You tell me how much you make. Now you have the power and you can understand if the company is treating you fairly or not. Uh, you can control budgeting and how much you budget, what kind of budget you're using and what your financial goals are. And then you can control the money tools you use, such as opening an IRA in your own name so that you are investing for retirement, such as having savings accounts, such as opening a 529 if you have children and beginning to save for their education. So you can see here in the middle, some things that we both can control and cannot control are spending, saving, and cost of living. So cost of living, let's start there. We can't control cost of living on our own, but we can make choices that say, well, I'm going to live in a smaller house so that my mortgage is less, right? Or I'm going to have a roommate so that I pay less in rent. Um, spending, we're going to say like, instead of going to the W for drinks, how about we go to this dive bar where instead of paying $18 per cocktail, I'm going to pay $6 per cocktail. So these are the things that we have to start thinking of when we think about financial health. What's in my control and to what degree do I have control over that? I don't want to um, overwhelm anyone with this. This is a big question and I really want you to leave here today thinking about this over the next couple of weeks. Like I mentioned earlier, all our lives are different. I certainly don't expect anyone to leave this presentation and be like, Perfect, I turned my whole financial life around in 48 hours. It takes years sometimes to change habits, to learn things about ourselves. And especially if we are part of a partnership or a household where there are other people making financial decisions, we're not just an island unto ourselves. We have to work with other people to achieve financial change. So I want you to just think about these things over the coming weeks. Okay, let's talk about budgeting. This is one of those areas that we can take action in. I love budgeting. I am an absolute budget evangelical. So budgets have a bad reputation. Who here already budgets in some way or form? Or who here feels like budgets are trash? <laughs> Who's like, I hate budgeting. Okay, we've got a couple of budgeters. <gasps> Look at y'all. You're like, mm, I am on the budget train. Someone says both. I budget and I hate it. <laughs> I love that. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, look, I think budgets get a bad reputation. A lot of people think budgeting is telling yourself to not spend money. Who here has ever like felt that way? You know, of like, oh, if I budget, that means I have to stop doing things I enjoy. Yes. People are saying that like, oh, if I, some, for some reason, I don't know why we think this way. We think if we look at our money, if we like tune in to what's going on with our money, it means that we will inherently have less money or we will inherently have less fun. So I always tell people it's not deprivation. It's not somebody yelling at you and your budget is not here trying to steal your joy. Your budget is an inanimate object, right? And even me as a financial professional, I'm not here to try and steal your joy. You know what I got in my budget? I got Netflix, I got restaurants, I got thrift shopping. There's a lot of things in my budget that bring me joy. I was just watching Netflix right before I hopped on here. I was like, a little treat for myself. <laughs> I'm gonna watch La Reina del Flow if you guys are not watching it. Oh, it's so good. 
It's on Netflix, check it out. Um, so budgeting is fundamentally just giving every dollar you earn a job. So what you're saying is, okay, here are my streams of income. And then here are my expenses. I earn $4,000 a month. I have to assign a job to every single one of those dollars. Some of those jobs are going to be pay rent, are going to be um, pay child care, right? But some of those are going to be Netflix. Some of those are going to be investing. All you're doing with your budget is organizing your dollars and telling them where to go. Budgeting puts you in charge as opposed to you getting to the end of every month going, I don't even know where all my money went. How did that happen? So I also want to stress that budgeting is a living thing. A lot of us, every January, we make a budget, right? And we're like, this is the year I pay off my credit card debt. Let's go. And then by March, we're like, where is that budget? That's completely unrealistic. I am not sticking to that. And I'm going to pretend like it never happened. How many, how many times has that happened to y'all? Let me know. I feel like we've all gone through it. I certainly have. The number one thing I want you to know about budgeting is that your budget should look different month to month. Let's just take December versus January as our example here, since we're already talking about the beginning of the year. What happens in December that does not happen in January? Um, Christmas, potentially Hanukkah, potentially Kwanzaa, uh, potentially time off from work, so maybe some travel. What's happening in January? Um, it's cold. People are trying to, like, you know, emotionally recover from spending 10 days with their family. Right? Yeah. These are two very different months for our money. So we shouldn't have the same budget each month. In December, if you do celebrate Christmas, for example, you're going to be spending a bunch of money on gifts, probably a bunch more money on travel. And then in January, you're not spending that money necessarily. Or maybe you have one birthday in January, but you don't have, oh, I got to buy a present for each and every one of my nieces and nephews. So I want you to give yourself permission to have a different budget month to month. All I want you to do with your budget is to track what comes in, track what goes out and allow for, sorry, there's someone who's not muted and I can hear you. If you could all just mute yourself, that would be great. Um, allow for things like, oh, well, in December we have the holidays. In January, we have nothing. In March, it's my mom's birthday and I'm gonna get her a gift. In April, it's my wedding anniversary. In May, it's nothing, right? And so that way you can plan your spending. So just here's a pretty basic example <laughs> on this little thing, but here on the um, pink, uh, rather the blue side, you can see I've got travel, gifts, debt, restaurants, and rent no car. But if you buy a car the next month, you're now going to have to pay car insurance. And then right here, it's supposed to say gas. I don't know why it doesn't. <laughs> um, and then we've still got gifts, debt, restaurant, and rent. So your budget can grow. It can shrink depending on what needs you have in your life and what needs you have month to month. Maybe you're pregnant right now. So right now you have no children, but in three months, you're going to have a child. <laughs> you're going to need a new budget, right? So here's how you can budget. There are a bunch of apps out there. There are so many budgeting apps. <laughs> it's an overwhelming amount, frankly. Um, and apps work, uh, you hook it up to your bank account and your credit card, your mortgage, your loans. So it's a third party app, you hook up to all of your digital information and then it tracks your spending. You can do this manually with a spreadsheet or a notebook as well. I personally find the most success with an app and a spreadsheet. So I manually track uh, my detailed spending and I use an app to hook up to my bank account, my credit card, um, my investments. What else is it? That's it, I guess, um, because I don't own property, but you can also link up your mortgage on some of these apps. And so that way I can just log into one place and see all my numbers. And I can kind of double check. Well, here's what my personal spreadsheet tells me. Let's go check it against uh, what the data in the app says. I find that to be the most helpful. I'm also a money nerd. You might not want to get into the spreadsheets and color coordinate them the way that I do. So it's totally fine. Um, but also you might be old school and you might just want to track in a notebook. And that's also fine. Fundamentally, all you're doing with budgeting is tracking what comes in and what goes out. So think about it this way. Your income is going to be your W-2 income. It's going to be any side hustles you have, like if you walk dogs or you babysit or you do copywriting at night, if you have alimony, if you have child support, um, if you have any dividends or like rental income or something like that, 
that is all going to be categorized as income. So let's say you get $5,000 a month from your W-2 plus your side hustle plus child support, five grand. And then your expenses are just going to be rent, childcare, groceries, clothes, gas, utilities, debt, um, investments, anything like that. Anything that is taking money out of your bank account, um, that's going to be an expense. I see here it says, someone says in the chat, curious about the data you'd be trading for a free budget app and where it's going. Oh, I'm someone who subscribes to the fact that there's no privacy on the internet anymore. I've been on the internet since 2007 in a like big way, you know, like with Facebook and all of these things. Everyone has all my data everywhere, personally. If you don't have any social media um, and you don't use any current like online platforms, um, you may have some privacy, but if you're using email, if you are using Google, they know who you are and they know all of your information. You can absolutely do some things to try and protect that, but unless you've been doing that since the beginning, the companies have all your information and yes, they're turning it into targeted ads to try and get you to buy more stuff. Hashtag capitalism, um, that's what it goes to. So personally, I'm okay with that. You can invest in an ad blocker or some sort of like privacy software if you want. Um, Personally, I'm not that concerned about it because like I said, all my data has been on the internet forever. So <laughs> that's me though. I want you to do, do what you're comfortable with. Okay, let's talk about investing. Who here is already investing? Like maybe you have a 403B or a 401K or a brokerage account. I'm curious, let me know. Yes, I'm seeing these yeses roll in. Oh, I love it. I'm so proud of y'all. Listen, if you're not already investing, I want you to know you can start literally today. You can open an IRA and get started investing today. It's so easy. Um, someone says, I think so, question mark. <laughs> like, maybe, I love that. Well, um, I'm gonna give you a little homework uh, there um, to check and see if you are investing. If you think you're investing, but you're not totally sure, that to me says that you probably signed up for a retirement workplace plan at some point when you like signed to the paperwork, but you're not totally sure what it is and has. So check with your employer, be like, hey, do I have a 401k or a 403b? Those are the two big ones. Just say, do we have a retirement plan? Am I signed up for that? Find out. You can also check your paycheck and see if there's some sort of deduction coming out of that for retirement. And that will let you know if something's going on. And then you can log in and kind of figure out the details from there. TRS. Oh yeah, that probably makes way more sense. TRS rather than a 401k. Um, okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about investing. So investing fundamentally means taking some of your money and giving it to another person or business in the hopes of getting a higher return than you would get without doing this. So if you invest in real estate, for example, you're doing so because you believe that buying that 300k house will bring you more money in rent or will bring you more money by selling it later than if you did not buy that house. And it's the same with the stock market. If you invest in the stock market, you're saying, hey, I think that the value of this stock that I own is going to bring me more money over the years than if I just leave my cash in a bank account getting 0.01% interest, uh, which is what all the major banks are giving you right now, by the way. So if you bank at Bank of America or Chase or Wells Fargo, I would politely but strongly encourage you to leave those banks behind because they're terrible and they treat their customers like crap. Um, we're not here to talk smack, but if you want to DM me later and talk smack, I'm happy to do that. So especially right now when inflation is so high, leaving your money, especially big chunks of money, like 20K, 30K in a savings account that's getting basically zero interest means you're essentially losing 8.3% to inflation every single month. So where do we do this investing? Um, when people talk about the stock market, could that be any more vaguer? Could that be any more vague, I guess? Um, what does that mean? Well, they're generally referring to the Dow Jones and the S&P 500. And what these are is stock indexes, AKA a collection of the biggest publicly traded, not publicly owned, I'm sorry, I need to take that out there, um, publicly traded companies in the United States, privately owned, publicly traded. The S&P, which stands for Standard & Poor, by the way, tracks, you guessed it, 500 companies, nice and easy to remember there. And the Dow Jones tracks 30 companies. So when I talk about big companies, we're talking about Apple, Nike, McDonald's, Goldman Sachs, American Express, Amazon, all of these huge companies that we use 
every day in some form, right? Like most of us probably have a Visa credit card. Visa is one of the biggest companies in the world. Um, and this is what we're talking about. Now, there are a bunch of other indexes. There's the NASDAQ you may have heard of. That's another really big popular one that gets talked about a lot in media. But there's like the Russell 3000. Um, there are so many indexes. And you can invest in any index. You can invest in an individual company. But when people talk about the stock market, they generally mean these two because these are the most influential uh, indexes in the United States. What makes the stock market move? Well, if you've been paying attention to the stock market for most of this year, you will have been noticing a trend, which is that it's going down, down, baby. And it goes up and down for a lot of reasons. But the root cause of any market movement is us. It's me and you. We have the power here because what we do affects the stock market. There is no such thing as a natural stock market. You're never going to go on a hike. <laughs> you know, you're never going to be like here. I'm in Austin. I don't know where everyone is, but like uh, we have the green belt. You're never going to be down by the green belt and then like stop your friend and be like, oh my God, look, it's a wild stock market. Oh, I never thought I'd see one in person. This is crazy. Oh my God. That's never going to happen. <laughs> Um, you might see like a Jaguar, I mean, not a Jaguar, what am I trying to say, a Bobcat. <laughs> um, you might see a Jaguar, I guess, but that would be very strange. Uh, you'll never see a wild stock market. That's because it's something we made up. So if all the humans just disappeared off the face of the earth, the stock market would stop. All the Bobcats would be fine. All of the, you know, bees and trees would be fine, but the stock market would stop. So it moves when anything happens, when politics change, when a global pandemic happens, when companies announce big changes. So Oprah a few years ago announced that she was partnering with uh, Weight Watchers and she had bought a bunch of stock and she single-handedly generated $750 million in stock market value because people love Oprah and people heard that she was buying Weight Watchers and they were like, I have to buy Weight Watchers. Like if Oprah's into it, I want to be into it. And she caused the value to go up. So it's impossible to predict how or when something will affect the market. It, and let me repeat that because a lot of people right now, a lot of news outlets right now are saying things like, we'll see a recession in Q3. Um, and there's a lot of kind of financial personalities who are like acting as if they have a crystal ball is the way I would put that. It's impossible to predict how or when something will affect the stock market. We all lived through March 2020 when we were like, oh my God, this scary new virus, we can't go outside of our houses, what the heck? And the market did what in March 2020? It crashed. And then what happened for the rest of the year? It went up and it broke record after record after record high. By all accounts, if you had said to me, Kara, it's March 13th, 2020, you're watching the market crash. What do you think the rest of 2020 is gonna be like in the stock market? I would have bet every single penny I have, it would have been one of the worst years on record. Another 2000, 2008, another 1929, you know, like every single penny and I would have been dead wrong. And I'm educated on the stock market. So please, 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 if anyone ever tells you that they can give you a guaranteed return or they know a sure thing, or they can tell you, September 17th, that's when the market's going to crash. Run, absolutely run, because they are scamming you. Just like this man, the ultimate scammer. This is Bernie Madoff, and he stole $64.8 billion via a hedge fund Ponzi scheme. And he did this. He told people, I can get you a guaranteed 46% return per year. If you go back and if you ever Google like, annual stock market returns or annual like S&P returns. There's a lot of charts out there that will show you since like 1930, how much the S&P has returned each year. And it'll be like negative 20% in 1930. <laughs> and then it's like negative 24%. And then in like 1960, it's like 18%. But you'll notice like the really high years rarely break 25%. Like if you get a 25% return on the stock market one year, you are doing insanely well, super well, very, very well. Warren Buffett well. Bernie Madoff was telling his clients he was guaranteeing 46%, at least 46% returns per year. 
way too good to be true. No one is that good at the stock market. That is a scam. Additional to that, like he also is telling people it would only cost them four cents per share to bank with him. So, um, or not to bank with him, to invest with him. And that's also a scam. If anything ever sounds too good to be true in the stock market, take a second, reassess, think about Bernie Madoff and be like, you know what? I'm going to need to do some more research. I'm going to need to DM Kara. I'm going to need to not do this because there have been a lot of very successful stock market scammers because people want to believe the best and people want their money to be more money. You know, I don't think any of us here today are like, I'm actually fine. I don't need any more money in my life. Like I'm good with what I've got forever. If I stopped earning money right now, I'd be able to survive for the rest of my life. Like I wouldn't. Um, And so I think a lot of us look at the stock market, we are a little bit mystified by it. And if somebody pops up and says, hey, let me show you the golden ticket, just consider what the golden ticket might actually be composed of. So now let's talk a little bit about retirement accounts. I'm just gonna have a little sip of water. I've been talking a lot. And so I saw in the chat that someone said, I guarantee you that the stock market will go up, down or stay flat. We got a scammer amongst us. What are these guarantees? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I'm just kidding. 100%, that is exactly what's going to happen. So you can believe anyone who says that. Like, it may change in some way. Correct. (laughs) Okay, now, um, it sounds like not everyone here is going to have a 401k um, or a 403b. We've got TRS, which I'm not super familiar with, um, but probably operates somewhat similarly to a 401k. But just really quickly, these three accounts you see here in front of you, these are some of the most common accounts, retirement accounts in the United States. So a 401k is only available through workplaces, meaning if you are self-employed or uh, unemployed um, or only part-time employed, you probably do not qualify for a 401k. The maximum personal contribution is actually 20,500. I need to update this. This is from last year. And generally they are pre-tax contributions, meaning the money comes directly from your paycheck into the stock market, it never hits your bank account. So you don't pay taxes on it the year you're making the contribution. You're postponing those taxes until you withdraw the money in retirement. Um, But the IRAs, let's talk about this. Remember earlier, I said, after I paid off my student loans, I started investing in an IRA. And I promised you, you would know what it was by the end. Well, if you don't know, here's, now's the time. We're coming full circle. Look at that. So there's something called a Roth IRA and a traditional IRA. IRA stands for Individual Retirement Account. And what that means is it's not tied to your workplace. Instead, it's tied to you as an individual. It's essentially tied to your social security number or your um like legal resident number. You don't have to be a citizen to have an IRA. You do need to be a legal resident. So whatever kind of paperwork goes with that, it's escaping me right now. Um, These are available to anyone who is 18 plus with earned income. Now you see these little sneaky, sneaky quote marks I'm using here. Earned income does not just mean money I earned from a job. Remember we talked in the budgeting session about maybe alimony or uh, child support. That counts as earned income to the IRS. So if you don't have a job um, at all, but you do collect alimony, you can open a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA. The maximum personal contribution for the year is $6,000 for either one. Now you're allowed to have both. You can open a Roth and a traditional IRA. I have both. You can only put $6,000 in between the two of them. So three in the Roth, three in the traditional, all good because that totals six. Six in the traditional, six in the Roth, bad news bears because that totals 12. So consider that. Now, Roth IRAs are what we call post-tax. So you do pay taxes the year you make the contribution. And then when you withdraw the money in retirement, you do not pay taxes again because you already did that way back when. The traditional IRA is pre-tax just like the 401k. You are going to pay the taxes the year you withdraw the money. The Roth IRA has an income limit. So that means, um, I believe, they changed them for this year. I believe it's $126,000 per individual tax filer and $148,000 for uh, married filing jointly. 
So if your household makes more than $148,000 married fine jointly, you cannot contribute to a Roth IRA. You have to contribute to a traditional. Um, and then if anyone here has like a, a spouse or a family member who does have a 401k and also wants to have a traditional IRA, um, you have to understand there are limits. So there's no income limit on a traditional IRA, but there are limits on how much you can put into a traditional IRA if you have a workplace plan. The government is like, hey, 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 we see you trying to put all this money pre-tax into this account. We're going to need a cut. So we're going to limit how much money you can put in there. Never forget that the government always comes for its taxes. So, <laughs> truly and always, they will come for their taxes. So this is just a brief breakdown of retirement accounts. There are a lot of other ones out there. If you hope to be self-employed someday, there's something called a solo 401k, which is what I have. Um, there is a SEP IRA or a simple IRA. There's a lot of self-employed retirement accounts as well. I'm not going to go into those today. Now I wanna stress this, an account is just the vehicle. It's not your investments. So someone here said earlier, like, I'm not sure if I'm investing. What I see a lot, what I see happen a lot is that people open an account and they think I'm investing, but that's not how it works. So think about it this way, your 401k or your IRA, that's the boat. So, okay, we've got the boat in the dark dock, like in the Harbor, right? But the boat doesn't go anywhere unless you get on the boat, right? The boat can't steer itself. I'm sure some boats can, but in this instance, this boat cannot steer itself. So the luggage that you put on the boat, that's the actual investments. So in this case, we get on the boat with our luggage, right? And so you open the 401k or the IRA, and then you go in and actually buy Google stock or Susie's Tacos stock or whatever it is. You have to actually purchase an investment within the account in order to be invested. If you just have a boat in the harbor, that's not really doing anything for your adventuring uh, ways, right? <laughs> uh, you have to actually get your luggage on the boat and then sail it into the sea. So when do you start investing? So I know here a bunch of people are already investing, but if you are not, like I said, you can leave here today and open an IRA. All you need for that is your employment information or where your money comes from information um, and your social security number or your uh, legal resident information, and you can open that at any brokerage, most brokerages, not any brokerages, most brokerages. And just here's a quote I want to leave y'all with, which is that time in the market is better than timing the market. Meaning a lot of people, especially when the market is down, think, well, I'm going to wait for it to go back up, or I'm going to wait for the right time to invest. Don't wait. There's never going to be, the sun is not going to light shine through the clouds down upon your face. And, you know, the universe is going to say, hey, Kara, now's the time to invest. This is it for you. <laughs> That's never going to happen. I wish it did. Unfortunately, it doesn't. You just have to get started ASAP because the more time you have in the market, the better chance you have of building wealth long term. Think about it this way. If you were able to invest for five years and you got a 10% return, you'd be like, oh, cool. Like, this is nice. Five years, great. But if you invested for 30 years and got a 10% return, you'd be like, holy moly, this is so much more money. Because <laughs> like, I had so much more time for that money to grow. Now, a few fears that I hear a lot when it comes to investing. First, I'm going to lose money. Don't be afraid of this because it's definitely going to happen. <laughs> That's what I always tell people. And we're experiencing it right now. I have lost, again, air quotes on that loss, a lot of money since the start of the year because the year started strong and then it took a tumble and then it tumbled some more in the stock market. But this is all the cycle of investing. Anyone here who remembers 2008 remembers the absolute carnage that was the stock market from really like late 2007 through 2009. It was bad. I really don't mean to take this lightly at all. It was a brutal, brutal time for a lot of people in the stock market. But then what happened starting in 2009? The stock market, not the rest of life, but the stock market recovered. It started to go up and then it entered what we call a bear market, which means the market is consistently going up quarter after quarter. And it did that for a decade, literally until March, 2020. And people were like, market always goes up. 
people, for, we forget so soon. <laughs> as soon as it was like one year of a good stock market, people were like, oh, you can't, you can't lose in this stock market. Um, so the market goes down, the market goes up. That's what it does. So just remain calm. Do not panic sell. Let the good times roll and then hold on through the bad times because the good times are coming again. I don't know what to buy, something else I hear a lot. I want you to reverse engineer your needs and goals to find the right investments for you. Don't just invest in something because your friend does it or your coworker does it or your dad thinks it's a good idea. Your dad is probably 20, 30 years older than you and has a very different investment time horizon than you do. So you're probably going to need some different investments than him. So do your own research. I've got a lot of uh, articles and tools about investing on my website. It's bravelygo.co. I'll drop that in the chat. Um, please, bravelygo.co. Um, do some research and think about what you need for your own investments. And then finally, I don't know who to trust. There's a lot of people out there who can help you with your money in general and also with investments. There are CFPs, which are certified financial planners. There's investment advisors. Um, there's life insurance salesmen posing as investment advisors. <laughs> and there's people like me, right? Financial educators. So I would encourage you to shop around if you're ever looking for someone to help with your money or to help in any way with your investments, ask them a lot of questions, ask them what their results are, what their you know background or education might be. Um, don't just go with someone again because like your mom recommended them or they came to, don't just go with me just because I did this like presentation. You know, if you wanted to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, which I do offer, you should email me and ask me questions is what I'm saying. And with anyone else to really understand if they're the right person for you. And if they're the person who's going to get you where you want to go. So what does a recession do to the market? So I just wanted to include this slide here today because we are seeing the markets down. In fact, I, I don't have my phone. I would check if the markets are down right now. I think they are. Um, we've seen a lot more market volatility and down towards than usual, again, with quotes there. But let's remember, there's no normal for the stock market. The stock market rarely, rarely has a day that looks incredibly similar to the day before it. And the market can swing in an instant. It doesn't even need a whole day to go from lows to record highs. So what we do know is recessions have a ripple effect through the entire economy, which in turn affects the stock market. So recessions impact things like jobs. We see a lot more layoffs in a recession. Recessions impact the price of housing. They impact the price of food. They impact GDP, gross domestic product. So of course, a recession will affect the stock market. Usually. It does mean the market is down for a little bit because people don't have as much money to invest. People's confidence in the markets are shaken. And usually we see more government intervention in the financial markets during a recession. I would really strongly encourage everyone here to do some reading on um, what to do in a recession and what not to do in a recession. I'm going to tell you right now, please, please, please do not panic sell your investments when they hit lows. I know it's hard to see. I know it can be really disappointing, especially if you are lower middle income and it takes you a while to build up investment money. You know, you're like, I had to work for six months to invest this $1,500 and then it got cut in half by the market. What the hell? It's That's very understandable. I feel the same way. But if you buy something at $1,500 and then it gets cut in half, and you sell at that point, you have locked in a loss. If you buy something at $1,500, it gets cut in half and you close out of the browser and go watch La Reina del Flow on Netflix for a couple of months, you're giving it back. <laughs> you're giving, I'm like, hashtag sponsored by Netflix. <laughs> but you are giving that money a chance to recover, to go back up to that $1,500 or to go above that $1,500. And remember what I said earlier, we're investing for decades, hopefully. It's not just these next five years or next five months. If you're not already in your 60s, let's say I'm 34. So just use myself as an example. I plan to be investing for another 30 years. I don't really care what happens this year in the stock market because I'm not taking money out. Now, if you are someone who's taking money out soon, I would recommend switching maybe from a lot of stock holdings to more bonds because those have less volatility, but that's just generally speaking, this is not specific financial advice. Um, I don't know your life. So I just don't want you to sell at record lows and record low, meaning your own personal record low, not like um, across the stock market. 
So basically, this is just the economic ripple of a recession. Certain industries close businesses or close overall. People are out of work. There's less spending in the economy, but there's more debt because um, instead of paying with cash outright, people are putting things on credit cards or they're getting bank loans. People are less able to invest, which means businesses have less money, which means the stock market is down. So that's kind of the economic ripple of a recession. So stay the course during a recession. If you are already investing, stick to your schedule if you can still afford it. If your income is not impacted, you can see a down stock market as being on sale. Do not try and time the market. Do not try and time the market. You do not know when it's going to go back up. I don't know when it's going to go back up. Don't try and time it. Think long term. Don't just think about the daily reports. Again, what is your 20-year investment plan, your 30-year investment plan? And if you are closer to retirement, consider more bonds than stocks right now. Younger investors, meaning if you are at least 15 years away from retirement, stay the course, stay with your stocks. Don't try and make any rash decisions. Someone says, what happens if the company you invest in isn't around in 30 years? So... This is a fantastic question. Here's the thing when there's a couple of different ways to answer this question. Let's circle back to this question because there's a couple of different ways to answer it and I wanna give it the time it needs, but I wanna quickly talk about debt because most Americans have debt. And if that's you, you don't have to share in the chat um, or you can, if you want, I would really love to destigmatize the idea of debt. You're not a bad person for having debt at all. Uh, debt is a way of life in the United States and that is again, a systemic issue. Um, so let's talk about paying it off. So what is debt? It's money you owe another person or institution. For example, student loans are a type of debt that you would owe to your university or the federal government because they fronted you that money to go to college. Let's talk about organizing your debt. And I'm just gonna need a little more water real quick. Also, where are we on time? Are we doing okay on time? We're getting close to time, uh, Kara, this is Leah, and we're um, set to end at 1.50. Okay. Now, um, if folks want to stay and keep talking and you're down for keeping talking, that's fine. I'm looking to get a Zoom host to cover uh, for me while I leave. <laughs> and, um, uh, but I just wanted to mention that. Yeah. And if we're keeping going. That sounds, that sounds good to me. I've only got like three more slides. So okay. Well, I think we'll be able to wrap it up, but if people want to linger um, while I answer that investing question, I think we'll be able to be done in like eight minutes. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. And I appreciate the folks who have volunteered to be hosts for me. I'm going to get in touch with you and thanks. thanks awesome. Sarah. Okay. Let's talk about organizing your debt. There are two main ways to organize your debt. And I literally just need to make a list of your debts. So sitting down and saying, here are all my debts. I'm going to organize them by interest rate. So that's demonstrated on the left here, which is to say my lowest is this student loan at 7.1% interest, then car loan at 14.3%, then credit card at credit card one, 28.6 and credit card two at 42.9. So that would be organizing your debt according to interest rate. And then you can also do it by amount of debt. It's also indicated by percentages here, but these would be dollars. So like 7,300, 17,100, 24,400. Now, what's the best way to pay off your debt? Mathematically speaking, if you pay off the debt with the highest interest rate first, you will save the most money because you will pay less in interest over time. But sometimes you have a $800 credit card debt or an $800 student loan and $20,000 in credit card debt, it's gonna be way easier to pay off that $800 student loan, right? So I'm team, there's no bad way to pay off debt, whatever works best for you and whatever keeps you going. So I want you to think about this. How are you best served by paying off debt? If you have a low interest debt or a huge debt like a mortgage, how are you best served with your extra money each month? Would you be better if you have a 1% um, interest rate on a debt and you are getting a 9% return in the stock market each month, you would probably be better served by investing your extra money and building that wealth and just making the minimum payment on that super low interest debt. Conversely, if you have a 
interest rate on your credit card, and you've got 10 grand in debt, and you're only getting 9% in the stock market, you're going to be better served by focusing on paying off that debt. So I want you to just consider that when you're thinking about your debt payoff strategy, the answer is personal, you may also just have a lot of like, stress around debt and paying off debt was the best thing I ever did for my mental health. And I will take that to the grave for sure. Like put that on my gravestone. I think if you want to make the choice to do what's right for your mental and emotional health, re-debt, you're never, ever going to regret that decision. But high interest debt is especially harmful, especially for lower income people. Um, it's very easy to get into that kind of debt and it's very hard to get out of it. So if you are lower income or you do live in a household where you have maybe multiple people you're responsible for, such as children or aging parents, I would focus on paying off your high interest debt first, no matter what the kind of rest of your financial life looks like, because that really can be a ball and chain around your neck for years. So here are the questions that I wanted to make sure that you answered. Um, I was gonna do this like kind of like a call and response thing, but just do this privacy, privately. First being, do you know how much your parents earn or if they invest? So this is thinking about um, family finances. If you are responsible for, or you will be responsible for aging parents um, and you're all of a sudden like, oh my gosh, I don't know if they have anything. I just want you to consider that a lot of us are financially responsible for another family member. Um, do you have your own bank account? And this goes for anyone who is married or legally partnered. Um, I always think it's very important to have money in your own name, no matter what, maybe your partner is the best person in the world. I'm sure they are. Please have some money in your own name um, just for whatever. Maybe it's because you like, okay, my partner's really into um, video games and musical instruments and I don't do either of those things. And if we had 100% joint finances and I watched him drop three grand on a base, I'd be furious, but he can drop three grand out of his own bank account on that. Um, and then do you track your income and spending right now? If you do not, or if you're not doing it in a way that feels good to you, it's time for a new budget. And again, I have plenty of budgeting tools on my website. I encourage you to go check that out. Okay. Once again, here's where you can find me on the internet. We are We Bravely Go on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, and then at Bravely Go on Twitter. I'm going to circle back to that question around what happens if the company you invest in isn't around in 30 years? So if you're investing in a publicly tr uh, traded company, uh, they have to jump through quite a few legal hoops to become a publicly traded company, including proving financial longevity. Now that said, we all know there are companies that go belly up in the stock market, like Enron, <laughs> right? Um, <clears throat> so there's no guarantee. There's absolutely no guarantee. That's why we diversify. You should not put all of your money in one company and assume that this company will do nothing but go up for the next 30 years and always be around. That's a bad investment plan. Instead, you want to be investing in things like index funds, mutual funds, exchange traded funds, perhaps a couple of individually picked companies like especially if you're a values-based investor, meaning um, you, for example, don't want to be investing in fossil fuels because that goes against your environmentalist beliefs. I'm someone who has divested out of fossil fuels and I invested into a solar powered company this year, but I also own a fossil fuel free index fund, which has, I think like 800 companies in it. So I'm inherently diversified. So if 500 of those companies go belly up, I still got 300, right? Plus my solar power company. So that's a way to kind of avoid that um, or to mitigate your risk. You cannot avoid risk in the stock market overall. Um, but if a company is publicly traded, um, they do have to <clears throat> show a bunch of like financial documents to the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. So I just want you to know that it's the companies have to do their due diligence before they can just pop into the stock market. Um, okay, and then how do you reach slash what is the best way to reach the decision of selling? This is a good question too. And then I see there's one more question and then I'll let everyone go. I'm not here to hold you hostage. <laughs> so the decision of selling is less about the market performance and more about your personal needs. Do you need any money you have in the stock market right now to pay your bills and live your life? If you do, then we need to consider selling. And so obviously the bare minimum for that kind of context is it has to be higher than it was when I bought in, right? Otherwise you're locking in a loss, as I mentioned earlier. 
But if you're watching something go up and up and up and you're kind of like, okay, when do I get off this rocket ship? That comes down to your risk tolerance and your sense of gambling sensibility. <laughs> Investing is not gambling. I shouldn't use that word. Um, but you never really know. You could sell on a Tuesday because a company reaches its highest all-time profit ever. And you're like, great, this is a wonderful moment for me. And then it goes up again on Wednesday. And you, we simply can't predict that. So you just have to know, how does this sale play into the rest of my financial life? One, do I need this money right now? Or can I let it sit for longer? Two, um, what are my tax liability if I make this sale? There's something called short-term capital gain taxes and long-term capital gain taxes. Which one will I incur and what will that be? Um, and do I have the money for that? So um, really the decision comes to like, what's going on in my financial life right now? Do I need to make this sale? What's the tax implication? How much am I actually going to walk away with? And how will this impact my overall investing strategy? Okay, and then final question, do you have resources that would be useful for college students? Yes, if you go on my website, I have like 147 blog posts. So there's all of that there. <laughs> um, and I also have on my website, I, I call it the money checklist, which I think is perfect for uh, college students or recently graduated college students. Um, that's like, it's just an organizer for your finances. So we talk about debt, we talk about investments, we talk about budgeting in just this downloadable PDF and that's available on my website. Um, and then what else do I have? Really my Instagram is chock full of stuff. You know, I had a, a reel go up yesterday about what is dollar cost averaging, which is an investment strategy that's very digestible for college kids. So I would direct them to my social media as well, which you can see here on the screen, my handles. Look at that. Um, thank you all so, so much for coming. Um, like I said, I would just love it if you would give us a follow on any of these platforms. That's a really easy way to help a small business of one, which is me, um, grow. Thank you for having me and for staying a little bit longer. I will stop sharing. I'm sorry to eat up an extra seven minutes of your time, but you have been great. Um, no, thank you. Um, I'm the one now taking on post. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for your um, what you presented. It was really awesome. Um, I did drop a link. If you people are hearing me still, the ones that are leaving, I dropped the link to the survey for the TCDL for 2022. Um, please fill that out at your earliest convenience. Bye. Bye. <laughs>